Hello and welcome. This educational material has been designed for a generalist level in obstetrics and gynecology. Specialists in gynecology oncology should be referred such cases for good management of cervical cancer patients. As the management options increase and as younger women have the disease, then to satisfy the patient's expectations from the treatment, it is generally preferred that the case is managed by gynae oncologists. As far as the pathophysiology and the etiology are concerned, the human papilloma virus transmitted during sexual activity are responsible for the vast majority cases of cervical cancer. HPV type 16 has the highest risk of causing cancer of the vulva, the vagina or the cervix in women. Two years after the infection, psychology reports will come back as abnormal and at times low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. A small proportion of HPV infections will progress to cancer and certain factors make the women more prone to cancer. These factors include starting sexual activity at a very young age, multiple sexual partners. If the male partner is promiscuous and has multiple partners, history of sexually transmitted diseases, HIV infection is associated with a five-fold increase in the risk of cervical cancer, presumably because of an impaired immune response to HPV infection. And lastly, exposure to diethyl stilbestrol in uterus. Frequency of this cancer varies in the world. It is the most common cancer in developing countries, whereas in developed countries, it is the second commonest cause of gynecological cancer related deaths. The HPV types causing adenocarcinoma are different from the types causing squamous carcinoma. HPV 16, which is a stronger carcinogen than the other HPV types has been found more frequently in younger women as opposed to older women. As far as the clinical presentation of cervical cancer is, a, is concerned, the patient may not have any symptoms if early cancer or even if CIN has been picked up uh, through pap smears screening or HPV screening and the patient may be entirely asymptomatic. However, when symptoms start to develop, the common symptoms are abnormal vaginal discharge, abnormal vaginal bleeding, usually postcoital, vaginal discomfort, malodorous discharge, and even dysuria. In case the cancer has spread beyond the cervix, then the symptoms will be related to the organ that the, the cancer has invaded. Similarly, on physical examination, the cervix will look and feel normal in early disease. Advanced cervix may have gross erosion, ulcer, or mass. The vagina may also show some induration, ulceration, or gross thickening. Rectal examination may reveal an external mass or gross blood from tumor erosion. Bimanual pelvic examination findings often reveal if there is any involvement of the extra pelvic tissue or the parametrial metastasis. Leg edema will suggest lymphatic or vascular obstruction caused by tumor. As far as the differential diagnosis is concerned, we can have a similar looking picture in cervicitis or cervical infection, particularly granulomatous infections primary melanoma of the cervix, vaginal cancer, 
And another rare possibility is that a primary cancer elsewhere in the body has metastasized to the cervix, for example, endometrial cancer. Endometrial polyps may also appear as with post-coital bleeding. The, the initial colposcopy, biopsy of the cervix, and the or possibly colonization of the cervix has been performed, then the staging, further staging of the cervical cancer is now dependent on the clinical, radiological, and the pathological findings as they are available to assign the stage. So at this stage now, if there is any suspicion, then we will perform a, um, a cystoscopy, proctosigmoidoscopy in bulky tumors, chest x-ray, and MRI or CT to evaluate the extent of the disease. And if need be, further testing will be done in the form of chest x-ray. Other tests that will be done to find out about the general health of the patient in case she is going for surgery or radiotherapy or adjuvant therapy, then the further testing will involve complete blood count, renal function test, blood urea, serum creatinine, urine detailed report, urine culture and sensitivity, liver function test, random and fasting blood sugar, MRI of the pelvis and the abdomen for possible metastatic disease, CT scanning and chest x-ray. As far as the histological types of, cancer, of cervical cancer is concerned, the most common type is the squamous cell carcinoma and 71% of all cervical tumors belong to this, this cell type. Uh, the, other cancer, the other histological types involved may be adenocarcinoma in about 25% of the cases or adenosquamous carcinoma, which is even more rare. In 2018, the FIGO Gynecologic Oncology Committee revised the 2009 staging to allow the option of clinical, radiological, or pathological findings as available to assign the stage. The main differences were that the horizontal dimensions of a microinvasive lesion is no longer considered. The tumor size has been stratified further into three subgroups. 1B1 is equal to or less than 2 centimeters. 1B2 is greater than 2 centimeters and less than or equal to 4 centimeters. And 1B3 is more than four centimeters. In addition to the size of the tumor, the lymph node positivity has also been restated and it correlates with poorer oncologic outcomes assigned to the stage 3C, pelvic nodes 3C1 and paraaortic nodes 3C2. Micrometastasis is now included in stage 3C, making it a very advanced form of cancer. So in FIGO stage 1, cancer of the cervix, according to the 2018 staging, the carcinoma is strictly confined to the cervix. Stage 1 is further subdivided into 1A and 1B. And 1A is further subdivided into 1A1 and 1A2, depending upon the level of infiltration or invasion of the stroma. 1B1 invasive carcinoma is also measured according to the invasion or the level of invasion. With the 1B1 having an invasion of greater than 5 millimeters, but less than 2 centimeters. And 1B2 having a 
depth of invasion of 2 centimeters and more or less than or equal to 4 centimeters. And 1B3 showing uh, invasion of greater than 4 centimeters. Stage 2 cancer of the cervix means that the cervix is now invaded beyond the uterus but has not extended onto the lower one third of the vagina or to the pelvic wall. Stage 2 is further subdivided into 2A in which there is involvement limited to the upper two thirds of the vagina without any parametrial involvement. And according to the dimension of the involvement, it is 2A1 and 2A2. Further, stage is 2B in which there is parametrial involvement but not up to the pelvic wall. In stage 3, the carcinoma involves the lower third of the vagina and or extends to the pelvic wall and or causes hydronephrosis of the non-functioning kidney and or involves pelvic and or paraaortic lymph nodes. So depending upon the level of uh, um, involvement, it is then further divided into 3A, 3B, 3C, and then 3C is further subdivided into 3C1 when the pelvic lymph nodes are involved and 3C2 when the paraaortic lymph nodes are involved. In stage 4, the carcinoma has extended beyond the true pelvis or has involved the mucosa of the bladder or the rectum. If on cystoscopy a bullous edema is seen, this does not permit a case to be allotted to stage 4. There has to be a biopsy formed. So 2A is spread of growth to adjacent pelvic organs such as the bladder or the rectum. And stage 4B is spread to a distant metastasis or distant organs such as the liver, the lungs, the brain or the bones. Role of surgery in the management of cervical cancer. Management of cervical cancer is primarily by surgery or radiation therapy with chemotherapy as a valuable adjunct. Surgery is suitable for early stages where cervical colonization, simple hysterectomy or radical hysterectomy may be selected according to the stage of the disease. The advantages of surgical treatment are, first of all, it is feasible to determine the post-operative stage precisely on the basis of histopathological findings, thereby enabling individualization of post-operative treatment. It is possible to treat cancers that are likely to be resistant to radiotherapy. And it is possible to conserve ovarian function. Radiation management also has a role in management of cervical cancer. In low and middle income countries, patients come to the hospital with advanced diseases where surgery cannot be done. In recent years, there has been advancement in how we plan and give radiotherapy. By using computer mapping and imaging, precise and proper dosages of radiotherapy can be provided. And this has helped patients get better results with fewer side effects. Radiotherapy is also useful as it prevents the recurrence of cancer in the same area. Although the role of dual modality is discouraged, this is also used as palliative therapy for alleviating distressing symptoms in patients with advanced incurable disease. The treatment for women with stage 1A1 cervical cancer is optional. The patient can have complete cervical sconization in those cases where women want to preserve their fertility. But in women who have completed childbearing or in elderly women, extra facial hysterectomy may also be recommended. When lymphatic vascular space invasion is evident, pelvic lymphadenectomy should be 
considered along with extrafacial hysterectomy. If fertility is desired, then cervical colonization with close follow-up will be adequate. In stage 1A2 of uh, cervical cancer, since there is a small risk of lymph node metastasis, pelvic lymphadenectomy is performed in addition to radical hysterectomy. In low-risk cases where there is no lymphatic vascular space involvement and the sentinel node is negative, Simple hysterectomy or trachelectomy combined with either pelvic lymph adenectomy or sentinel lymph node assessment may be adequate surgical treatment. When the patient desires fertility, she may be offered a choice of the following. Cervical conization with pelvic lymph adenectomy, either open or minimal and minimally invasive surgery or radical trachelectomy with pelvic lymph adenectomy by abdominal, vaginal, or minimally invasive surgical route. In stage 1b1, the standard management is radical hysterectomy, but modified radical hysterectomy may be considered. Pelvic lymph adenectomy should always be included on account of the high frequency of lymph node involvement. Although surgery is preferred for early stage disease, in cases with contraindications for surgery or anesthesia, radiotherapy provides equally good results in terms of local control and survival. In young women desiring fertility sparing surgery, a radical trachelectomy may be performed where the cervix along with the parametrium is removed. And this procedure can be done abdominally, vaginally, or by minimally invasive routes. In stage 1b2 and 2a1, surgery or radiotherapy can be chosen as the primary treatment depending on other patient factors and local resources. Both these modalities have similar outcomes. A laparoscopic approach to cervical cancer study was conducted. This was a randomized trial that compared overall survival with open surgery as compared to laparoscopy or robotic surgery in early stage cervical cancer. In this study, it was seen that there was a decreased overall survival in the minimally invasive surgical group, indicating that in those countries where these modalities are not present, open surgery still carries a very good prognosis in terms of survival. In stage 1b3 and 2a2, the tumors are larger and the likelihood of high risk factors such as positive lymph nodes, positive parametria or positive surgical margins that increase the risk of recurrence and require adjuvant radiation after surgery are high. However, the dual modality treatment increases the risk of major morbidity to the patient. In stage, in stage 1b3 and 2a2, in such cases, adjuvant whole pelvic irradiation reduces the local failure rate and improves progression-free survival compared with patients who are treated with surgery alone. Here as well, the dual modality treatment increases the risk of major morbidity to the patient. Treatment for 4A and B disease. Rarely patients with stage 4A disease may have only central disease without involvement up to the pelvic sidewall or distant spread. Such cases or in the case of such a recurrence, pelvic exenteration can be considered, but this usually carries a very poor prognosis. Presentation of distant metastasis at this stage is also rare and is reported in about 2% of cases. A management plan should consider that a median duration of survival with distant metastasis is approximately 7 months. Despite limited response rates, chemotherapy has also been added and combination chemotherapy may also be used. However, at this stage, the recurrence of cervical cancer has a very really poor prognosis with at the most 10% survival. 
The prognosis in patients with cervical cancer depends on the disease stage. And as a general rule, the five year survival rates are as follows. In stage one, greater than 90%. In stage two, 60 to 80%. In stage three, approximately 50%. In stage four, it is much less than 30%. And where there is recurrence, it is less than 10%. So palliation means to ease the severity of the pain or the problem of with, or, or the disease without removing the underlying cause. Short course radiotherapy is very effective in palliation of distressing symptoms. The distressing symptoms include severe vaginal bleeding and control of bleeding is usually achieved after 12 to 12, 48 hours of radiotherapy. The other symptoms is severe pain arising from enlarged paraaortic or supraclavicular nodes, skeletal metastasis and symptoms associated with cerebral metastasis. Post-treatment follow-up in cervical cancer. Routine follow-up visits are recommended every three to four months for the first two to three years, then every six months until five years, and then annually for life. At each visit, history taking and clinical examination are carried out to detect treatment complications and psychosexual morbidity, as well as assess for recurrent disease. Frequent vaginal wall cytology does not significantly improve the detection of early disease recurrence. Women under the age of 50 years who have lost ovarian function should be considered for menopausal hormone therapy. As women age, the routine examination should also include other age indicated well women checks to ensure quality of life including assessment of thyroid and renal status. What happens if a patient is pregnant and she is diagnosed to have cervical cancer? Adequate management of these patients requires a multidisciplinary team. The plan must be discussed with the patient and ideally her partner too to respect the wishes of the parents. Broadly, the management of cervical cancer in pregnancy follows the same principles as in non-pregnant patients. Before 16 to 20 weeks of gestation, patients are treated without delay. The mode of therapy can be either surgery or chemoradiation, depending on the stage of the disease. Radiation often results in spontaneous abortion of the conceptus. From the late second trimester onwards, surgery and chemotherapy can be used in selected cases while preserving the pregnancy. When the diagnosis is made after 20 weeks, delaying definitive treatment is valid option for stage 1A2, 1B1 and 1B2, which has not been shown to have any negative impact on the prognosis compared with non-pregnant patients. Timing of delivery requires a balance between maternal and fetal health interests. When delivered at a tertiary center with appropriate neonatal care, delivery by classical cesarean section and radical hysterectomy at the same time is undertaken no later than 34 weeks of gestation. For more advanced disease, the impact of treatment delay on survival is not known. With this, we come to the end of the video. If you like the video, then please subscribe, press the like button, give your comments, share with friends and colleagues, press the bell icon to be made aware of future videos which are released. Thank you and goodbye.